This episode of the What If Podcast is brought to you in part by Button Poetry, where poetry isn't dead. As the premier place online for live performance videos of spoken word and slam poetry, Button Poetry won't bore you like your high school English textbooks did. Find real stories you'll want to listen to and art you'll actually care about by visiting them today at buttonpoetry.com. Before we kick into the show today, we just wanted to say uh, a thank you to everybody who's been listening and sharing and loving the show. And uh, we just wanted to know if y'all could do us one favor in potentially three different ways. Yeah. The first one, we got a survey. It's up at whatifpodcast.com slash survey. It is. And uh, we need some of y'all to fill it out, please, if you enjoy listening to our show. That will help us mucho. Yeah, it helps us sustain the show. It helps us uh, figure out kind of who's listening, who you guys are. And uh, and we love you beautiful little weirdos. And, and we want to be weirdos with you for as long as we possibly can. So that helps us out a lot. Secondly, if you've been enjoying the show, uh, a rating on iTunes or a rating and a review on iTunes or the podcast app would help us greatly very big uh thank you to everybody who's done that in the last week i feel like every time we talk about it five ten more you just hop on and do it so thank you we actually made a deal with uh some people on our facebook page too that if that gets up to 100 we're gonna do a facebook live episode for y'all yeah, which yeah. should be a, a party yeah y'all can chime in and comment and and we'll be live on stream and uh and we'll answer questions and hang out with y'all for an hour or so and uh and just goof off so uh the, the sooner we get to 100 uh, the sooner we can do that show yeah and then, uh, and then lastly, uh, if you haven't, uh, one of the biggest ways that people have found and, and love this show is just by telling a friend. So anything you can do on social, share. Uh, we're at What If Pod on pretty much everything that is social. Um, otherwise, WhatIfPodcast.com. Just share the show with a friend and tell them that you've been loving hanging out with us. We've been loving hanging out with you. And um, if you just holler at a friend and let them know, uh, that means the world to us too. So... Uh, we know the best ways we learn about podcasts is by our friends being like, hey, go check this shit out. It's awesome. So True. Uh, if you feel that way, uh, tell a friend and, and we would be grateful as well. So, yeah, uh, thank you guys so much for listening. And and thank you so much for, uh, like we said, filling out that quick survey. What if podcast dot com slash survey, throwing us a rating and review and telling a friend we love you to death. And we got a fun show. Oh, baby boy. Yeah, let's get into it. Welcome to the What If Podcast with your hosts, Spencer Worth Davis and Ryan Copperood. Humanity is actually under the control of dinosaur like alien reptiles called the Babylonian Brotherhood, who must consume human blood to maintain their human appearance. Yeah. Hey, Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That was Mr. Eric Mason uh, singing David Icke quotes for you. Boy, that is going to have to become a repeated segment if there's any way we have control over it, which, thank God, we do. Mason, oh boy, I broke my microphone. Uh, <laughs> Mason was going to join us tonight, but he couldn't, but we managed to get him for about half an hour to uh, record some audio for us, and, and uh, that was one of the things he chose to record. So. And there'll be more finding their way into your earballs throughout the course shout of this out, hour. Shout out to Eric Mason, and he's yeah. going to be on with us next week for a full episode. So. Yes, yes. Should the we, return of Mason is imminent. Should we tell people what we're talking about next week? It'll be like the first time ever that we gave people a That preview. we've known a week ahead of time what we're going to be talking about? <laughs> I think we've known, we've just never Ooh. actually like made it very clear to the listenership what that will be. We'll tell them at the end of the episode. We haven't even said what we're talking about this week yet. Well, that's okay. Uh, I'm with that. We'll we'll tell you at the end. We'll give you a little quick preview of what's coming next week. But for this week on the What If Podcast, uh, we are, I guess this is like kind of a part two to last week, but not exactly. We're more... It's a, um, it's a sister episode to yeah, last week. that works. Um, last week, if you listened to us, uh, you heard us talk about the question, what if you couldn't forget? And this week, we're going to flip that question on its head, and we're wondering what happens, uh, what if you couldn't remember? My bro, welcome to the party. Welcome to the party. <laughs> I forgot to open with that, so that's that's where that goes. That's perfect. Um, shout, yeah. out, shout out to Kelvin. Shout out to Brother Nature. Um, we're, we're talking about memory again, but in a very different way this week. What if you could not remember? Which we kind of started last week's episode talking about you and I's personal inabilities to remember things. I'm I'm an advanced non-rememberer. <laughs> I find myself in that category as well, relatively often. Um, but man, it's 
it gets a lot more complicated than like would you would you eat would you right. wear it gets right. a lot weirder uh and and a lot like a lot tougher honestly some of these are a little little rough little weird little rough I, I actually don't know what what story you're going with tonight. So okay, uh, and I also I also don't know your story either. Sweet. So we have um, rock paper scissors for who goes first. Uh, is okay. Wait, I have a question for you about rock paper scissors. Okay, is Rochambeau the same thing as rock paper scissors? I think so. I don't know what that means though. Okay, I don't either. Should we good googly moogly uh, Rochambeau, or we could just make it up? Because I well. It's originally remember, from the, the movie Rambo. No, it's not. Don't you lie to me. A lie was born. <laughs> you motherfucker. <laughs> oh, God. Um, I'm going to run that shit into the ground by the end of this episode. I mean, honestly, if we uh, if we lie as much on this episode. I don't as, even care. Anytime you say anything, I'm just. <laughs> A lie was born. It's so it's so much less fair because I don't have a button to push about yeah, no, lies being born or not. Well, um, uh, why do people call it why Rochambeau? You, why are you googling rock paper scissors? Okay, right now, you want to do it? Rock paper yeah. scissors. Uh, best of three or best of one? Just one. All right. Rock paper uh, shoot. All right, I'm going first. All right. Uh, Spencer had scissors. By the way, I had paper. Yeah, there you go. It's a it's a visual game. <laughs> it's a visual game. On a they just heard. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> Probably know we were playing Batty Cake. <laughs> All right, two thousand four, August, okay. summertime. All right, we're in Richmond Hill, Georgia. It's hot as balls Ugh. in Richmond Hill, Georgia, in August. It's hot in here. I can't imagine how hot it is in Re- Georgia. You know, Nelly played at the uh, at the Twin Stadium last night. Dude, I'm so sad that I wasn't there. He closed with hot in here. Of course he did. Yep. Backed up by the Backstreet Boys. I don't know what to say. (laughs) The tour is Backstreet Boys, Nelly, and Florida Georgia Line, and they played at Target Field last night. I mean, I guess like good on for all of those artists to make that choice. Shout out to whoever put that tour together. And they're not they're not losing money. That's no, for sure. They're selling all those shows out. (laughs) I bet they are. I bet they are. Anyway, two thousand four in. In Richmond Hill, Georgia. Where it's hot as hell. Yes. A Burger King employee is opening the store for the day. Yep. And uh, she finds a naked man lying unconscious in front of the dumpsters behind the restaurant. Good morning. Yeah. So she calls the cops and reports that there's a uh, a naked, apparently blind man laying next to a dumpster. And an ambulance comes and picks him up and takes him to the hospital in Savannah, Georgia. Yikes. And nobody knew who he was, and he was admitted uh, under the name Burger King Doe. See, that's just, just disrespectful. That's well, just, <laughs> just disrespectful. they had a John Doe, so they had to specify. I mean, John Doe 2 would be less disrespectful than Burger King Burger Doe. Burger King Doe. <laughs> <laughs> but how about that Burger King Doe? <laughs> uh, so Burger King Doe appeared to be a healthy white man in his mid-50s. Okay. Uh, all of his vital signs were fine. His, his He didn't have any drugs or alcohol in his system. Um, and on his chart, a doctor wrote that his vitals were, quote, surprisingly within normal limits <laughs> for a man who was lying naked next to a dumpster, passed out. I like that. I like that low-key doctor shade. <laughs> like, like, this dude should be pretty fucked up, but he seems pretty normal. <laughs> like, um. He had a long beard and had and hair and hadn't washed and was dirty and nasty, uh, so they assumed that he was a homeless person. That seems like a very logical assumption. Except that he mind. was in like pretty good health, which I guess is possible. But yeah, apparently, but if you're naked in a fast food parking lot by a dumpster, it wouldn't be like a wrong decision right. to believe that right. that was a possibility. Uh, psychologically, he was not doing as well though. Um, he wouldn't talk to anybody. He wouldn't eat. He wouldn't open his eyes, um, Dude, and he, he was so full of Burger King. That's why. <laughs> that's why Burger King induced coma. <laughs> he went blind from Burger King <laughs> consumption. <laughs> Did you know that if you eat three pounds of chicken fries in one sitting, you go blind? A lie was born. <laughs> I swear I'm not going to play it every minute, but I might. I might play it every minute. Uh, <laughs> I'm just so proud. Like, that's the best thing we've done as a podcast yet. Thank you so much, Mason. Thank you so much for blessing us with that. Um, 
Yeah, he wouldn't talk to anybody. He wouldn't eat anything. Uh, he wouldn't even open his eyes. And whenever anybody would touch him, he freaked out and started thrashing around. Yes. All right. Um, after a few days, he started talking, but what he said didn't really make a whole lot of sense. He said he had lived in the woods for 17 years. Um, he he would swear at the nurses whenever they would try and talk to him and called them beasts and demons. Oh, yep. okay. Uh, he tried to hit and spit on them when they would get near him. He then requested to see a priest, which they allowed and brought in a priest to see him. If it's a hospital, there's generally one hanging around. Right. And uh, <laughs> when the priest showed up, though, he called him an imposter and muttered, you're all devils. Cool. Cool. Yep. Cool. Um, so doctors assumed that he, or not assumed, they diagnosed him with uh, catatonic schizophrenia. Okay. And prescribed him some sort of antipsychotic drugs. Sure. Uh, once he kind of stabilized after being on drugs for a few days, um, they started trying to figure out who he was. Cause like no one had reported him missing. No one mm-hmm. had checked with the hospitals. He hadn't said anything about who he was or anything like that. No one had reported a Burger King dough. Right. Missing. Right. Um, he, I'm joking, but that is a problem with these cases with amnesiacs in general is like, Sometimes descriptions can be uh, not entirely super specific or you're looking for a name. And if someone's found with no identification and doesn't have one of those on their own, that yeah. like superiorly complicates the identification process. Exactly. So, yeah, he uh, when they started talking to him, he didn't know his name. He didn't know where he was from. He didn't know how he had ended up where he was. Um. The only thing that he could remember was that he thought he was from Indianapolis, which is pretty far from Georgia. Sure enough. Um, and that he was pretty sure he had three brothers. Okay. But when they started asking him about, you know, who who do you live with? Who do you know? Anything like that. Anyone that they could get in contact with about him. Yep. He realized that he couldn't think of any, he couldn't think of a single person that he knew outside of. He thought he had three brothers, but he didn't know their names or anything like that. Can I just say something really quickly? Yeah. I, so Spencer and I have been reading about amnesia for the last week or so in a lot of stories that have like similar characteristics like this one. And honestly, like the one thing that struck me about that moment, because a lot of people point to that moment of of like self-reflection on what they can or can't identify. Who the fuck am I? <laughs> Um, that moment, you mean? <laughs> we can never be serious on the show again because now we have these drops. Who I say, who the <laughs> fuck am I? But in all reality, like a lot of people in that moment, like, is there anything scarier than that moment when you don't, when you, when you can't point to another human connection that you're aware of? I mean, like, I would I, think not. I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. Like these days, obviously, you can't. You know, a lot of people don't even remember the cell phone number of their closest of kin to call them if you were in fucking jail. I mean, I don't, I know I feel that way, but to really legitimately be like, I don't, I wouldn't even if I if I had a cell phone number for someone, I wouldn't even know who to call because I don't, don't have a, a a line in this world. You don't have any any phone numbers memorized. My parents got rid of their home line that I have had since I was like a like a high schooler and that's the one phone number that was like emblazoned in my head and now I can't really remember <laughs> like literally none yeah I've been trying to that's remember crazy. my girls <laughs> haven't talked to her in months no. <laughs> I can't remember her phone number <laughs> I know <laughs> I just hit her with the go to contact information and oh, then you shouldn't start sentences that way hit her up I've got <laughs> I know my wife's phone number all right I was about to just say it. That's not that's not a good idea at all. Uh I, I know my dad's phone number. I'm like ninety percent sure I know my brother's phone number. That's good. Uh I know Eric's phone number. Okay. I probably know like five to maybe seven phone numbers. That's good. They don't they don't stick in my brain and and I think it's so the concept to me is so terrifying that even if I did have those numbers logged, but I didn't like I couldn't think of a familial or friendly connection that I could make from a from a hospital bed. That would be like so 
horrifying. If my middle school friend's parents still have their landlines, I know a bunch of people's <laughs> phone numbers. Hey, I know we haven't talked in 15 years, but I'm definitely in trouble. I could use some help. So BK Doe uh, comes to, and he has no idea who he is. He doesn't know anyone. Yeah. He's not even sure why he's in Georgia because he thinks he's from Indianapolis. Right. And uh, he only can think of a few very vague moments of his life. Um, right. One being the inside of a movie theater. Uh, the other one being a long road through a cornfield. That's sort of oddly specific and random. But not useful in any way. Yeah. Um, not, I should say, oddly specific, but also non-specific in a way that it's not identifying in any real right. way. Um, and he remembers parts of what he thinks uh, are Denver. So he, he's okay. pretty sure he was in Denver at some point. Um, right. Right. Not at all. Thanks. Like, yeah, yeah millions and millions of people have been in Denver at right. some point. Right. Um, the only thing that he was certain of was that his birthday was August 29th of 1948. All right. Now that's oddly specific, but. Right. And actually potentially useful. What year was this again? Uh, that he was found? Yeah. Uh, 2004. 2004. So he thought he was born in 48? Mm hmm So he would have been 60. No, wait. <laughs> no. Hang on. 50. <laughs> wait six. for it. There we go. There we go. Hang on. Hang on. Math is hard. Um, the first doctor that he saw thought he was pretending to have amnesia because everything else about him seemed too he seemed too coherent otherwise he didn't have um and, you know and there were no physical symptoms aside from the first couple days he, he seemed to be psychologically fine once he was on his medication okay um and his memory about things unrelated to him was not impaired so like for instance he knew that george w bush was president Okay. And that uh, the U.S. had just invaded Iraq. Okay. He, like, current events, he was aware of somehow. Okay. But he remembered nothing relating to himself. Going back ever, forever. Other than... Outside a, of a, a potential birth date. Other than a, a couple very, yeah, okay. vague things. I, I think I have three brothers. I think I'm from Indianapolis. Yeah, yeah. I'm certain that I know my birthday. That was That was it. Wow, okay. Um, he also thought his name was Benjamin. And in case you want to Google this, it's spelled with two A's, B-E-N-J-A-M-A-N, like Benjamin. Got it. Um, <clears throat> but he couldn't remember his last name. He settled on Kyle because it his initials were BK, I think. All right. Yeah. So anyway. I for, mean, if you're having a hard time remembering things, maybe that's like a little bit of a... Well, I mean, he said he didn't know his last name, but he took on the name Benjamin Kyle. Yeah, I guess I mean, like, if like if someone's been calling you BK Doe and you need to, like, remember something that you're having a hard oh, time remembering, right, you right. might be like, K, K names, well, K, K, Kyle. The other strange okay, thing I'm was, good. though, he didn't have any problems forming new memories after he was found. So, like, doctor comes in week one... Hi, I'm Dr. Smith. Nice to meet you, Dr. Smith. Week two, Dr. Smith comes back. He says, hi, Dr. Smith. Nice to meet you. Right. Or nice to see you again. Aside from the 50-year gap going backwards, his his working memory was fine. Okay. Um, yeah. And so he took on the name Benjamin Kyle. So if you want to look into this guy, that's that's what will get you there. Yep. Um, and for years, no one was able to find out anything about him. Um, a bunch of journalists got involved. Police got involved, FBI got involved, a bunch of um, missing people or missing persons experts got involved, and they couldn't find out literally anything about him. Um, they even put out, so the police, and then later on, uh, a bunch of different like newspapers, and he, he made a bunch of TV appearances, and his picture was distributed to millions and millions of people, and not a single person came forward saying that they recognized him. And we're, like the TV appearances, et cetera, were all for the purpose of being like, I don't know who I am. Do you know who I am? Kind of. Yeah, thing? it was. I mean, if you if you Google this, it was a huge national story. He was on 
NPR. Uh, he was on CNN. He went on Dr. Phil at one point. He was making major TV appearances just to be like, I don't know who I am. I haven't been able to find out anything about myself or any of my family. No one's come forward looking for me. Mm. Um, and the reason it was was a problem was because he couldn't he couldn't do anything. He couldn't get work. He couldn't yeah. he couldn't get a place to live. I mean, he has no form of identification. He doesn't even know his name. So you can't apply for a job. You can't apply for an. You can't rent an apartment. What's your social? Uh, right. Well, and he wasn't even allowed in shelters because he had no, no identification and no mm. name. Even he couldn't fly. He couldn't. He couldn't do anything. Jesus. And he's an older guy too. Yeah, I mean, you're in your late fifties. Yeah, and uh, so he was. I mean, that was the reason for him that he was trying so hard to. To figure this out right. was like his own his day to day survival was going to depend on it sooner than later. Yeah, yeah. Um, the FBI fingerprinted him, and it did not match any sets of fingerprints that they had. They put his his photo out on its website. Nothing. He was the first uh, person that the FBI ever categorized as a missing person, even though he his location was known. Okay. So they knew exactly where he was, but he was on their missing persons page because he didn't know who he was. As in if you if you know this man kind of that right. that conversation that happens of like if you've seen this person well, anywhere or you and know it was, this person. It would have been the same process that because any right. any information like, oh, I saw him on this day at this time would have been useful because then you can say, Okay, I was in I actually was in Denver or yeah. I used to live in Indianapolis or then you can start following some of those leads piecing it together right um they also sent out uh his prints and photo to interpol and to canadian authorities uh the u.s they contacted the u.s marshals to see if maybe he was someone involved in the witness protection program oh wow and they all came back negative so he was they left him in their database as an unidentified living person Whoa, that's a fucking weird phrase. Right? Oh. What a title, dude. Oh. International man of mystery over here. <laughs> fucking Captain Jason Bourne, but like B right. BK Bourne. Well, and it's... You guys, I've seen all of the Jason Bourne movies. Don't really? worry. Even the most... There was one that came out like a year ago. I did not see the most recent one. <sighs> it's, but actually, I, it's, it's exactly as good as all the other ones. <laughs> Which is like, if you need an action movie, that's kind it's of It's like a 7 out of well 10 done. action movie every time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's great. I saw the Dollar Theater. It was absolutely worth a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> that's hot. Great review. I really want to start doing the movies Ryan hasn't seen section on our website. Yeah, we should do it. Where we review movies. We should do it. Okay. Where I just say things about movies I haven't seen and make sure. I want up. you to just describe what you think the Stan Romanek movie is. A All right. So what happened was <laughs> he put there's a guy, right? He put an alien head on a stick. A lot of many people have asked me about that movie and about doing something about it. I got it recently too, actually related to this podcast that we do here about the weird things. Yeah. Have, have you world. watched it? No, I didn't why, why watch the fuck it. Why are we talking about Stan Romanek right now? But yeah, keep going. Th we're not going to talk about that film because it sucks. If you want to laugh at a man who put alien masks on broomsticks, I and guess go for it. And pictures of them in his backyard or whatever. Yeah, and then like also got arrested on child porn charges, and for Ew. some reason Netflix is paying him to make movies. Uh, what? Yeah, I, the whole thing sucks. I don't... No, not into no, it. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. we should we should have never talked about this. So not even to make fun. I of I guess it. I brought that up to answer like eight emails at the same time. <laughs> We're not going to do it. Sorry. <laughs> uh, anyway, in two thousand eight, so four years pass, and he's still he's no closer to knowing. What are you doing for four years? Okay, great question. So he couldn't work, right? Or not like in any legal way. So he he would do odd jobs and like mow lawns, and the one thing that he that came back was that he knew a fair amount about um, working in restaurants and in kitchens. Mm -hmm. And he also knew a lot about um, like uh, commercial kitchen appliances. Mm. So like commercial stoves and freezers and coolers and all that stuff. Interesting. Um, 
and about like electrical engineering or just kind of electrical maintenance type of stuff. So he would he did sort of like handyman type of work. And okay. um, after he left, so he was discharged from the hospital after, I don't know, not very long. Yeah, that would be tough. It's like, is there anything medically wrong with you? No. Like, is there anything the hospital can fix in your body right now? No. You right. don't really have a reason to be here anymore. Right. So he bounced around. To you don't have fucking health insurance. Right. You don't have any money, we don't think. You at least don't, you know. Not you that do. anyone's aware of when you're taking up a bed every night. Right. So Damn. He, uh, he went to a shelter, and then what, he could only stay at the shelter for so long, but one of the women who worked at the shelter um, took him in and, like, let him live at her house. Word. In exchange for, like, doing stuff around the house and like whatever and she in the meantime was then trying to help him figure out who he was and any connections that he may have had yep um so for yeah after four years of that he appeared on dr phil in 2008 and four years after okay yeah um and before he went on the show the producers wanted to like vet him and his story to make sure that it was true because a lot of people suspected that he was faking it for attention or something like that. Yeah, well, or to avoid something in his past. Um, we'll and, talk about that later. Oh, cool, cool. Um, but part of their process was they had to meet with a, a neuropsychologist who ran a bunch of different psychological tests with him, um, including one that showed he was uh, in the 95th percentile IQ-wise. Wow. Yeah. And uh that uh that doctor concluded his conclusion was that um BK, I guess we'll call him, was suffering from something called dissociative amnesia. Mm, sure. So amnesia brought on by um some sort of trauma traumatic event. Sure. So your brain is dissociating from some sort of traumatic event, but then at the same time blocking out a huge area of your memory. Sure. Um, like almost like Loki multiple personality where like one of your personalities is your main personality and you like escape from that personality and have no details about your current personality kind of. I, I don't know enough about how dissociative personality sort of works. Yeah. Word. I've, I've, yeah, I don't, I don't know much about that. I'm, I will, I will, I will only say in the way that I've said it, like sounds potentially I, related, but not. Maybe not specifically related. I have known and worked with people that have diso like different types of dissociative disorders, and I know they almost never had any memory of what was happening during the dissociative event. Sure, um, but that was a you know that would be like a matter of minutes or hours rather than this dude was missing his entire life basically. Yeah. Um. So anyway, they they went forward with the with the show. And um, the the whole thing was sort of just to try and call attention to it, see if anyone knew him. They right. actually, um, they had some artists, because they didn't know how long he had been missing for, yep. run back like digital regressions of what he might look like at different ages. Sure. Because they thought part of the, part of the issue may have been if he had been missing for years, Anybody who recognized him would have been how he looked at 30 or 40 or 50 rather than his current age. It's like and if he'd been living on the street or living pretty rough, he may have aged more. His appearance may have changed more than you would anticipate during the same amount of time. It's interesting. I feel like that's exactly what we do with missing children on milk boxes, but in reverse. Like kids who yeah. go missing at a younger age, they try to age them in photos to say they would be 16 at this point or they would be 18 at this point. Yeah. And this is what we think they might look like at this time. It's crazy that you would go backwards with it. But I mean, it makes sense, but it's mm -hmm. just like, it does, it's wildly uncommon. And during that episode, he said something that like really, I'm not sure why, but it just really caught me off guard. He, um, when they found him, he had cataracts, which they then later repaired so you could see again. But when mm -hmm. they found him, he was basically blind. And which also led them to think he had been living kind of rough for kind of a while because that's right. something that develops over time. Um, and he said, 
so he a couple of months after he got to shelter, he had surgery and they he could see again. And the first time he looked at himself in a mirror, he said he was shocked by how old he was. And he had thought up hmm. until that point that he was in his thirties. Huh. So he sees himself in the mirror for the first time and sees, you know, he's like fifty five or fifty six or whatever. Yeah. And he felt like he he thought or he felt like he was in his thirties until he actually saw himself. Which I don't I mean, I don't really know what that does for this story. I just thought it was a unique thing that he chose to share. Yeah, and I think it's an interesting like it's interesting as it relates to um what you know versus how you feel. Yeah. Like that that's a those are there's an interesting I don't know what the connection is there, but there's an interesting element of like you, we can there are things that we know about ourselves and there are like assumptions that we make about ourselves and it's interesting that someone who has no memory of who they are at all um could it could be making assumptions uh, about themselves or 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 have sort of more general thoughts about who they are and and how old they are and things like that yeah well and that was that was something he brought up too was he didn't have any memories of himself but he said he always felt like he knew who he was Mm. on like a personality level mm. and he knew what things he liked and didn't like and yeah. you know he what he liked to do with his with his free time um he said he had a an implicit sense of himself as a person uh he knew what he liked and didn't like his habits his emotion emotional architecture he called it um he was a diehard liberal he was a lapsed Catholic, so he knew that he was Catholic, but had then kind of not. fallen away from <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. Um, he was pretty sure he had always had a mustache and that he had always smoked. Okay. He even said, quote, I'm pretty sure I stopped smoking once about 30 years ago, but then took it up again last year and haven't been able to shake it. Huh. So almost like he went back, he reverted almost to an older hmm. way of, uh, or an older version of him, himself and his habits. Um, he said he, ab he had abhorred, is that how you say that word? Abhorred. I can never say that word right. Abhorred, yeah. Abhorred? Abhorred. He abhorred physical contact and had a deep-seated love of movie theaters, tools, and science fiction novels. Sounds like kind of a loner. Sometimes he'd start reading one only to realize halfway through that he had read it before. Oof. <laughs> Dude, it just sounds like freaky. It sounds like a weird, Yeah. Yeah, so this whole time he's, I mean, he's doing like the biggest TV you can do. He's on Dr. Phil, he's on CNN, ABC, right. NPR. He's doing stuff overseas. He was on BBC. He's doing articles with The Guardian. Nothing came back. And uh, he met with a hypnotist at one point to try and uncover whatever memories might be locked oh, in there. Oh, here we go. No, nothing. Well, that's good because that shit's bullshit for what it's worth. I mean, he found out that he was abducted by aliens, but he didn't find out anything else Dude, about himself. Get the fuck out of here with that <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he was struggling pretty hard because the he contacted the Social Security Administration and they told him that they could not issue him a Social Security number because they already had. They just couldn't tell him what it was. But sure. they were sure that he had one. Because he was an American citizen ostensibly for mm -hmm. an extended period of time. And he theoretically had had been working and earning money and right. um he said at one point quote well you know i've been in this identity benjamin kyle for a long time and even if they do figure out who i am i'm probably still gonna feel like benjamin kyle now mm. so he was he was in this like in between spot where he's like i like who i am and i i feel like i'm who i am yeah but just to keep surviving i need to find out who I am or who I was. Right. right. Um, and he said, the only reason I keep going is because of social security. Uh, he was, he's but at this point he was in his sixties. He guessed. <laughs> That's the other thing. This is all based on like, but didn't I think he... I know my birthday. Oh, right. Right. They couldn't right. verify that in any right. way. That he... was the one thing he said that he remembered, but yes. I don't know if you want to trust this guy when it comes to memory. Yeah. Um, I have a clear memory of this one very specific detail. And literally nothing and else. no other specific <laughs> details in my brain. Uh, his retirement plan was to buy one lottery ticket per day. Bruh. <laughs> he 
he said, tomorrow if I won the lottery, I'd say to hell with it and I'd stop looking. And he also said, if I if I win the lottery, I'm pretty sure I would have a hundred new relatives the next day. <laughs> uh, hello, Benjamin Kyle, you yeah. naked dumpster Burger King baby. I don't think you could even claim it, though, could you? Who? Uh, Family the, members? No, I don't think you could claim the winnings. Sure, you could. How? If you bought if you bought a lottery ticket and you brought it in and you they're not going to give it to you in cash. Well, what do you mean? He can't deposit. He can't open a bank account. He, he can't had cash to, a check. He had to have been able to open a bank account in the six or eight years. Since. No, you have to. You have to be able to be given some sort of an assumed identity. Go walk into a bank without your wallet and try to open an account. I mean, yeah, but there has to be a point at which that's like that's not the case anymore. No. Like, you can't get a new driver's license under... Like, people change their he, names all the time. Can't he just be like, I'm trying to change my name? No, because he had no proof that he ever was anybody else. Dude, imagine the stuff that you need an ID to do. Literally everything. Right. <laughs> Basically, literally everything. This dude everything. couldn't buy a beer. Fuck that. Yes, he could. He ain't getting ID'd at a bar. He's 56 He's, years yeah, old. Yeah, he was 60 and missing some teeth and some hair. But. I'd be fucking raggedy as fuck. Like, I mean, yeah, that'd be the only thing I'd be doing is drinking my but, ass into a stupor. I mean, he he had no bank account. He couldn't he couldn't get housing. He couldn't yeah. get a job. Yeah, he couldn't. They they literally. There's a documentary about him where they filmed him walking into a homeless shelter and being turned away because he didn't have ID. That's crazy. Yeah. So I, I honestly I don't. They'd give him the check, but what are you, you going to walk into checks cashed today <laughs> with a with a sixty million dollar check and tell him to take their fifteen? I'm, I guess they'd probably figure it out. But yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think he'd still be out of luck. I guess. Yeah, I'm going to need that in 20s. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what you do. I got a really big backpack. <laughs> I'll be fine. So this dude lived entirely off the grid for from 2004 until 2015. Jesus. Yeah. So 11 years. Uh, I mean, for chunks of it, he was homeless. He Did he stay in Georgia? He moved down to Florida at one point. Um, is I'm not sure how he got there. I don't know if he like he got a ride with somebody because he couldn't fly. Well, he had to have fly. He had to have flown to be on like Doctor Phil and shit like that. That was the one time he flew, and they made like a U.S. Marshal fly with him. <laughs> Jesus, yeah. Um, so he must have, and he he didn't have a driver's license. I mean, I guess he could have still driven. You could but, probably buy like a bus ticket without an ID, right? Or I mean, you, like Doctor Phil probably catch a ride threw with him somebody. a couple G's to be on the show, and then he like bought a bus ticket to Florida or some shit. Yeah, he did some uh, he did some reality TV stuff at one point too that paid him somehow. That's so fucked up that we're I, like, you can't even cash a check though. This dude doesn't have a family. Let's put him on TV. People will watch this shit. Well, and so there were there was it's that fucked up America. There were, were fucked up everybody. There was at least one documentary about him, and in the U.S., it was the reaction was largely like what we've been talking about, like oh man, that sucks, and like who is this guy? And everywhere else, they were like, hey, America, why don't you get your shit together and let this guy work? Like why why is your sit? Because it brings up all these questions about like why do you need ID to do all of those things? Mm-hmm. Why do I need a social security number to stay at a homeless shelter? Or fucking give me a new one. Like, I think I pretty well proved to you over the last eight fucking years that I'm not a person anymore. So can I I be a person again? I I have no idea where my social security card is. I know exactly (laughs) where mine is, bro. You should find that (laughs) shit. Dude, they give you a piece of paper. It's not a tight system. Like, they don't. And you can't laminate it. And you no, can't you do can't anything to it. it. I, had to get I, a, I worked with a young man with autism who made, I thought, the very good decision to laminate his uh, social security card. And then you realize it was invalidated at that point? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I knew that, and he didn't consult with me about that, oh. but he was like, oh, I lose stuff, and I like am not good at taking care of things. I'm going to be proactive and like make sure this thing lasts. And then he tried to go get his social security check, and they are like... <sighs> Yeah, no, we can't. We can't take this. That's a that's a tough that's a tough learning moment to mm-hmm. be like. 
But what do you right. even learn from that? It doesn't make any fucking sense. No, it doesn't. But like, it's a tough learning moment. You in, learn like, that you buy the into bureaucracy yeah. or you don't get money, I hey, guess. Hey, bro, 98% of the time, what you did was probably very uh, smart and astute very observation. A smart, very uh, smart. A very uh, <laughs> smart and astute <laughs> observation. Uh, now, though, in this current situation, don't do that again. Anyway, in 2015... So there were a couple of different uh, genealogists, I think is the word, and like private detectives and a bunch of people who came forward on his behalf to be like, I want to help you figure this out. I can see that. Um, he did a couple of different AMAs on Reddit and like there was, there were a ton of people working on this. And one of the genealogists that was working on it called him in 2015 and just said, hey, I know who you are. And she had somehow figured it out that he was William Burgess Powell from Lafayette, Indiana. And she had come across a a high school yearbook that he was in from Lafayette, Indiana. Wow. Jefferson High School class of I think it was 67 or something. And uh she managed to track him down and found his three brothers still living in Indiana. What? After 11 years of this dude living in his other new, his personality. Yo, is this for real? Yeah. Did they recognize him? So he was, she found out that he was the second son of Furman and Marjorie Powell. He was born in Lafayette, an hour, an hour. (laughs) Strong name. Furman Powell. Bang. Um, Born in Lafayette, an hour north of Indianapolis. Uh, he went to Catholic school. Uh, his father died in 69. His mother died in 96. He had three brothers. So all, he was the three things he remembered. I'm from Indy. He was right. I, I have three, three brothers. brothers. He was right. And I was Catholic. He was right. The one huh. discrepancy. Um, oh, he's two of his brothers were still alive. The, uh, and one of them lived in the family house in Lafayette still. So like, Will William slash BK's childhood home, his younger brother still lived in. Okay. Um, and so he he reconnected with them and never uh never spoke to the media again and just said, I'm out. I'm I'm out. Thank you. But also I'm done. Now. Kindly fuck off. Yeah, right. I would be too. Yeah. I had to deal with y'all for my survival for a fucking decade. Right. Ugh. And I got I mean, I got this out of it, but I also got 11 years of being fucking broken, homeless, and... Confused as fuck. Yeah. Damn. Um, and so they they sort of tracked down where he came from, but there was still this huge gap, because when they talked to his brother, um, his brother like, had... When's the last time you saw your bro, and where did you see him? 76. His brother hadn't seen him since 1976. So it had been over 25 years. No, they found him in in fifteen. They've been damn near forty years. No, no, I'm saying when he got found by the media was oh four, so that would have been twenty eight years. Oh, right, 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 right. When yes. he was found yes. at the Burger King, yes. it was twenty eight years it, it, after at his that point. Had it had been twenty eight years since his brother had yeah. seen. Him. Yeah, and then add another decade on top of that. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. And so he still has this gap from, and then. They found uh, this like old drinking buddy of his who said that one night they decided drunkenly to move from Indiana to Boulder, Colorado and just got in their car from the bar and drove to Boulder. (laughs) Damn, we should stop drinking, bro. (laughs) We should stop drinking. We're going to forget our whole lives. Oh, fuck. (laughs) So, but even that, that dude hadn't seen him since uh, 85 or 86. So nobody knows where this dude was for like a decade um, or two. Yeah, there's no record of him between 1983 and 2004. Christ. And they figured out his social and all that stuff, and he reported no income. He filed no taxes. He had no employment. He had no address for 21 years. Jesus. I mean, if if we go back to the beginning, one of the first things he said when he was in his like crazy stupor when they first found him is, "I lived in the woods for seventeen years." So Maybe he that did. would that would more or less line up with what they found out later. 
But uh, yeah, so he, he freaky, moved man. home. Uh, he apparently lives with his brother. And uh, he hasn't talked to anybody since fall of 15. Wow. William wow. Powell. But yeah, he he uh, got reunited with a bunch of extended family <laughs> who he he didn't remember any of them upon meeting them. So none of the, none of that memory came back, even like moving home and seeing all these people. But also, if you factor in like time, it, and, yeah, if yeah. I saw family that I I mean, shit, I haven't even been alive for forty years. But if you if you see someone forty years later, I'm not sure you'd recognize them anyway. No, no. even without a traumatic memory event, you might maybe remember like, oh, aunt so and so had a nephew so and so, but like even yeah. that is a stretch, probably. Yeah. Yikes. Oy vey, bro. So yeah, uh, don't move. Don't get in a car with your buddies on a drinking night and move to another state because you might fucking disappear <laughs> for seventeen. You fucking might then years. decide to move to the woods for seventeen years. Jesus Christ! Uh, um, but yeah, Benjamin Kyle is going to get you more information about this guy. If you search William Powell, not as much comes up because that's fairly recent and yeah, um, a more common name than Benjamin with two A's. Word, man. Word. That's what I got. Yo. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break here. Um, we're going to come back, and um, I'm going to tell you all about the invisible gorilla, and we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, how our brains can be a little bit faulty. Um, I, have, I have a story about, uh, about um, Kent Cochran, and uh, maybe if we have time, I'm going to tell another story that I'm really excited about about um about a man named mario wait for it wait for it we're all waiting bro mario brunetti whoa baby boy and we'll be back in one second on the what if podcast Mm -hmm. this episode of the what if podcast is brought to you in part by button poetry Check them out right now by visiting buttonpoetry.com. Button poetry is nothing like the traditional poetry you heard in high school, and they're certainly not the same old, boring dead guys that are going to put you to sleep. Button poetry features poets of all ages, races, sexual orientations, and backgrounds, and as a poetry press and an online destination for spoken word and slam poetry videos, Button Poetry publishes poetry that moves people. They believe that real current stories and real current voices are more necessary now than ever. You know, everyone says changing the world with art is impossible, but at Button Poetry, they're sure going to try. So check out everything they have to offer. There's books, there's videos, there's commentary, there's learning, there's education. There's so much stuff uh, that you can get by checking them out at buttonpoetry.com. Today, you will fall in love with poetry all over again, or maybe for the very first time. Wait, I remember. Oh, fuck. No, I don't. Oh, fuck. No, I don't. I remember where we are. Hi, Spencer's What If Podcast. Hey. We be back, and we back, and we back. Oh, Jesus. We're talking about what if you couldn't remember, as opposed to what if you couldn't forget. Um, I have that first problem, not so much the second one. Yeah. Yeah. What if you... Wait. What? I don't remember shit. I forget shit like a fucking boss. Oh, yeah, all the time. All the time. A-plus, forget her. I write shit down everywhere. I just got a whiteboard in my basement for the exclusive purpose of trying to remember more shit and organize my brain better. Whiteboards are tight. Whiteboards are tight. Get your ass a whiteboard. Amazon has like $30 whiteboards, and they're like two feet by three feet, and they're magnetic, and you can like fucking magnet shit to them and write There's on them. one and, right over there. Hell yeah, we got one in says the studio. That my record's done. Yeah, Big Cash record coming soon. What up? Yeah. All right, bro. I want to tell you about the Invisible Gorilla. Okay. What you know about Invisible Gorillas, well, bro? I know what you told me about earlier. You I kind of ruined the experiment for me. Though. I did a little bit, but it's 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 hard to not ruin, especially because I think a lot of people who like if you've had a um, 
if you had a psych course at some point, you you maybe semi likely saw this experiment happen. You got to stop calling it that and call it the thing that's called on YouTube because you just ruined the experiment for everyone. The well, no, that's what it is called on YouTube. No, it's not. What you mean? There's one called Monkey Business and there's no. one called the Invisible Gorilla. No, you're wrong. Boy, stop. Watch this. What I, what watch, I, watch me work. Watch me work. Show me what you got. What I will tell you while you're looking this up to try to prove me wrong is that it's called selective attention test. So that so what I will what I will tell you is that Christopher Chabris and Daniel Simons, who are professors in the psychology departments of Union College in Schenectady, New York, Schenectady, New York, excuse me. Such a good word. And great movie too. Yeah. And oh it's a tough movie though. Good movie, but tough movie. And uh the University of Illinois, um, they did an experiment that became a book called The Invisible Gorilla. So that's partially why that phrase is popularized. In I'm some just ways. saying if you call it that it right. makes it hard to do the experiment. No doubt. I mean, they called their book that, so they realized they were ruining their experiment for lots of people. But this happened in the 90s. It happened in 1994. So they, when they were doing that experiment in 94, I think they figured that like it was kind of ruined in general. Fair enough. So the idea is uh, Christopher and Daniel did an experiment in their respective uh, psychological departments that involved the creation of a video. And in the video... There are three people in white T-shirts and three people in black T-shirts. And one person in a white T-shirt and one person in a black T-shirt both are holding a, uh, it's like a kickball or a basketball or a sports ball of some a kind. A playground ball? A playground ball. A four-square ball? A four-square ball uh, that you could bounce on the ground. And what the instructions for the person engaging the experiment are to watch the people in the white shirts and count how many passes are made of the ball between the people in the white shirts, right? So how, you're how many dimes? How many dimes get dropped um by the the team in in the white jerseys? Uh and so that's what you're supposed to focus on. It, it the video lasts about a minute and 30 seconds. If you go Google the Invisible Gorilla, you will find this on YouTube. Uh and as Spencer very correctly points out and the name spoils is that about 45 seconds into the video a man in a black gorilla suit walks into the middle of the frame, beats his chest for like two seconds, and then walks his ass back out the side of the frame. Sure now, does. in my explanation to this to you, you would say, okay, that sounds obvious as fuck that that would be something that I would see while focusing my attention in that department. Explain it to me. But I'll explain to you that... Uh, 48% of the time when people who do this experiment and are asked to count the number of passes, 48% uh, of the time people designate that nothing out of the ordinary happened while they were watching the video and counting the passes. Better said, 48% of people, almost half of the people who watch this 90 second video have no recollection of a man in a fucking gorilla suit walking across the video and beating his chest and then walking his ass back off the screen. That shit was crazy. And it is kind of crazy. You're right. Because like, I, so I showed Spencer this video. <laughs> You're just addressing Dubai kid directly now. <laughs> hey man, what's up Dubai kid? <laughs> Great point, dude. <laughs> I showed Spencer this video before we got on air and... And it, it seems like I understand the concept seems kind of silly. The, the, the experiment seems kind of silly. The even the um, like the presumed obviousness of if you're just hearing this experiment talked about seems kind of silly. But I think the the point that they were trying to prove and that they have continued to work on is how often memory fails us, how bad our memories and our perception are as human beings. Or what I should say I, is... I think an important distinction, too, that they're getting at, though, is without us realizing it. Oh, 100%. It's, it's one thing to be like, oh, shit, I can't remember where I put my keys. Yeah. Or, wait, did she say 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock? Yeah. But this is like, we have no idea that a, a major thing even occurred, right. even though we were looking straight at it. Yep. And we would be convinced of the opposite. Yep. 
A hundred percent. There's another one that they have on their website. If you go to the invisible uh, <laughs> slash videos. Yes, that's a real Dude, thing. Are you, what, um, are you, what are you sending our listeners to right no, now? No, no, it's dope. It's dope. It's, it's these guys who wrote this book about perception and memory and they, they're psych professors, so they have a bunch of these cool, weird experiments embedded on this one page. And there's another one that totally speaks to your point right now, which is called, uh, it's called a movie perception test, a conversation. And in this video, it's a two and a half minute long video from 1997. And what they do is they intentionally stage things awkwardly in the course of a three camera conversation, right? So you have a main shot that has both people. You have a, you have a solo shot that's like a, a mid on both of the conversation participants. And it's a really drab conversation about a girl being like, oh, the reason I brought you here was because I need some help planning my boyfriend's surprise party and I blah, blah, blah. And they're going back and forth. The, the perception test is that throughout the course of this video, there are multiple things that change in the setup of the video. So in one scene, she's wearing a scarf. In one scene, she's not. In one scene, her plate is red. In one scene, her plate is yellow. In one shot, uh, their, their drinks are switched. Like, there's all these like small details that they change almost every time the camera changes. But people who watch the conversation, once they get to the end of it, are asked, what did you notice about this conversation was there anything out of place and you start racking your brain and going like well i don't know she asked her for hell maybe they know you know like you don't you don't yeah. actually think about the embedded details in the conversation but when you actually they go okay now let's rewatch the video you're like what the fuck how did i not like she was legitimately wearing a scarf and then not wearing a scarf again it seems trivial but i think to your point the the point they're trying to make is yes it is trivial but the point is that until it's not Exactly. Until it's not, there's a lot of things that we don't realize we don't see until we're told that we're not seeing them. And I think that's a really uh, interesting and sort of uh, deep part of memory that we don't often talk about. We, we kind of talked about it a tiny bit last week, but we didn't really fully get into it. But the, the idea of how unreliable our memories are is uh, sort of thorough and a little bit uh a little bit scary or weird sometimes i wonder how that changes based on what sense is being used or what senses are being used that's an interesting question i because don't know because in all of these examples they're visual uh true you're not being asked to recall what you heard or right. obviously it's a video so you can't recall uh you know taste or touch or what any other senses other than what you see and hear. Yeah. I wonder if some are cuz like we know our vision is not to be trusted. Uh yeah. And yeah. and this I know this isn't a measure of vision it's it's more a measure of focus and retention and and forming and and recall I guess. Yes. Um but I wonder if some are more accurate than others. Yeah, that's a good question. Or if, I, or if when you have to combine them, the more senses you're combining, if, if that decreases the efficiency of each or... or sure, like if you're, fo if you're forced to focus on one, is that one better, like, listen for the number of or whatever? Well, it's... I, I think about it from a, <clears throat> an audio perspective. Yeah. If you watch or if you have a face-to-face a -face conversation with somebody... Yeah. So little of what you recall are the actual words being said. Sure. Versus yeah. if you then take it a step removed to watching someone speak. Yes. You're going to recall, you're going to focus more on what they're actually saying. Right. If you take it a step further and you're just listening to someone speak, you're going to only focus on the words that they're saying. Sure. Makes sense. To the point where... Yeah, if you've ever listened to a, a podcast where somebody has uh, a, a crutch phrase or something that gets really annoying really quickly, <laughs> yeah. even if you could have a conversation with that person face to face and you would probably never notice that instead of asking questions, they just say right at the end of every sentence. Yes. Or that they say like 300 times in a, in a minute. Yes. Those. So I, I wonder if because your, uh, your attention is being intentionally focused on, on a single on sense. a conversation yeah what do i hear and what does that become because i'm only hearing it 
Right. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think there's definitely, I think that makes a lot of sense. And there are definitely, um, there, there's definitely some data to support that, I guess. I mean, the one that I think is really interesting that also um, comes from some of the data around uh, Simons and I think it's Chabris, I think is how it's pronounced or yeah, Chab- I, I'm going to go with Chabris. Sure. Um, one of the things that they talk about that I think is kind of fascinating is um, they did a whole bunch of studies related to myths about memory. So basically asking people questions related to memory and asking true or false or do you agree or disagree um, just to see how the public views our memories and and all those things. Um, like, for instance, uh, people with amnesia can't recall their name or identity and 83% of people generally agree with that statement, even though it's possible that many people can remember their name and their identity without remembering a lot of other things. So amnesia as a thing, people think like, oh, if you have amnesia, you don't remember your name or who you are. But there I think are a lot of that is because of how it's portrayed in or used as a plot device in movies. <laughs> they literally say Hollywood in <laughs> yeah, this article yeah. about about that. Because it is, right? It's a it's a total like Hollywood in, is a unless you're Benjamin Kyle who had yeah. exactly a Hollywood version of amnesia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Hollywood totally is a very uh a very easy standing grounds to go, oh, we can create a fascinating, thrilling discovery story by someone if you not knowing this it. one thing. Right. Yeah. Are you my mother? (laughs) Jason Bourne was not looking for his mother. He was looking for his... Destruction. Murderer. (laughs) Um, He was uh, looking for his murderer? I don't think that was the plot, bro. His murderer? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, he was. The first movie, he was... He was murdered, and then he started seeking him out? The first movie, he wakes up, and he has five bullets in his back, and he's floating in the ocean, and he gets pulled aboard of a ship... And the dude on the ship nurses him back to health, and he okay. needs to find Attempted out. Attempted murderer. Okay, yeah. I'm not saying he's a ghost going back into his life to figure, but somebody wait, shot wait, him. You haven't seen the new one. Okay, sure, yes. <laughs> Maybe they did need to, after three movies, take it a full step further. Yeah. Um, the fourth one is actually just the movie Ghost. <laughs> except with a lot more bullets and kung fu. I'm spooked as heck. Um Another one, uh, people say hypnosis is useful in helping witnesses accurately recall details of a crime, and 55% of people generally agree with that sentiment, even though there is no science to back up the fact that hypnosis actually helps people uh, find more memories. In fact, we're not going to get into false memory because that's a whole other situation, and it often... Aliens. Alien. No, <laughs> there are some aliens there, but there, but mostly false memory goes down weird, bad paths of uh, of psychologists trying to attribute people's um, sort of uh, psychological tendencies or emotions uh, with suggestive things that they suggest, and those things often become uh, memories that people have that are patently false, proven to be false. Like alien abductions. Um, alien abductions can be it, but can also be the much more harmful things like assault and abuse and yeah. things like that that are kind of getting injected into people's brains via hypnosis and psychologists. And at that point, is there a difference? Uh, between what? In terms of the effect that that then has on a person? What do you mean? If you genuinely believe something happened, is that any different from it happening in terms of the the trauma that it would inflict on you? Um, no, probably not for the individual, but often the cases of false memory um, that are the sort of more difficult ones are the ones where people base their life on memories that they, I'm throwing quotations, <laughs> uncovered in a... Uh, a series of therapy. That's what I'm saying. At that point, it, it whether it is or not, it becomes real to that person. Right? Yeah, to the point that many of these people base some of their their lives around events that they, again, I'm throwing quotes, yeah, remember. Dog, um, I, I know you don't spend as much time digging into this shit as I do, but you're word for word explaining like what alien abductions are. Yes. No. I understand. Yeah. I understand that that is okay. that is an element of this. Yeah. Um. 
but uh, then it also applies to other like maybe more serious things. More so, recovered memory therapy is often yikes. Is often that name sounds hideous. Yeah. It, it um basically there are hypnosis sedatives and probing questions where therapists also get the word probing out of your description of what you're doing, psychologist. One hundred percent. Uh, therapists believe that repressed memories of traumatic events are often the cause of their clients' problems. And there have been, um, there have been lawsuits around libel and slander, wherein people have accused family members of abuse that literally never happened that have taken like massive tolls on family. And have been these massive news stories where there's actually no evidence of this happening. But throughout a period of someone going through a period of anxiety or depression, or et cetera, they've gone through recovery memory therapy with a therapist that has turned Oof. their memory to believe something that actually legitimately never happens. But again, you know, regardless of that, you know, that practice and how like wrong that is, et cetera, the idea again is our memories are kind of fickle and they can be. Hell yeah. That, I mean, that's why people and, believe that is because our memories are not. They're not concrete in any right. way. They're totally subjective. Right. And to the point where someone else can convince you that something happened to you because yes. your own memory, even to you, is not exact. Yep. Um, a big one that uh, that gets talked about sometimes is uh, combining memories. Um, basically... Uh, I won't go into all the details of this study, but it's an interesting study... Um, if you look up, let me find this person. That's name how you again. get the Mandela effect. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> no, honestly, though, shout out to that one episode of our podcast that yeah. literally no one ever listened to. Uh, J- yeah, right. <laughs> it's got like four <laughs> listens still. I think three of them are me <laughs> to make sure it was working. Um, Jason Chan is an assistant professor of psychology at Iowa State University, who's done a bunch of uh, research around the failure of memory, and. Um, he he talks about the concept of combining memory. And there's actually a really specific example of um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who actually published a very public apology about a thing that he said in a speech where he says that he remembered George W. Bush saying something in a speech post 9-11, and he criticized him for it. It was related to, uh, the quote is, I'm going to botch this really bad, but it's something about... Um, it's some, it, it, it had something to do with like the religions of the attackers on 9-11 and the, the, the stars being named by their gods or something like that. Um, and essentially what, what got sussed out over time was people trying to figure out where that information came from. And it was a conflation of two different quotes, neither of which actually had the outcome that, that DeGrasse Tyson remembered them having. And so in 2014 or 2015, he apologized on Facebook saying, look, these were two separate incidences, both of which were really traumatic memories. And I realize now that I think I conflated these two quotes to create a thought stream in my head of something that he said. And I am now accepting that I am proven wrong, that this was never something that actually got said. And Chan Neil deGrasse Tyson admitted he was wrong about I know, something, right? Isn't that fucking mind blowing? Such a douche sometimes. <laughs> don't get me, don't get it. Hey, you guys, don't get us wrong. We fucking love Neil deGrasse Tyson, but sometimes Neil deGrasse Tyson is a douche. Yeah, uh, he he. I just, wouldn't say I love Neil deGrasse Tyson. Okay, I think he's tight. I like a lot of what he does, but sometimes I, he could be kind of douchey about how brilliant he is. Yeah. There we go. And, and and often that's enough for me to be like, fuck <laughs> off. There are other people who are just as smart as you that don't think they're the greatest thing ever. You guys, Spencer doesn't like authority, just for, just so you know, <laughs> <laughs> generally speaking. This is true. <laughs> um, but Chan's article is about uh, the combination of memories, and, and he doesn't speak specifically to the Negras Tyson incident, but that's one of the more publicly uh, understood mem- uh, ideas of memory combination, where we can have one experience and then have another completely different experience. And over time, we talked about this last week, the ping-ponging of memories oh, when yeah. you throw it out and it comes back and you throw it out and it comes back and it changes a little bit differently each time. You can actually conflate two things into a single memory. When you start thinking about how our memories, I, 
I don't really know exactly how our brain forms memories, but yeah. If you think about, we won't pretend to on this show. <laughs> how many moments there are in a day? Yeah, and I'm assuming most of them just get immediately forgotten, right? Like the fact that I typed something into Google at 2 p.m. today has already left my brain. Yes, right. I'm not. This that's, is true. There's some way of prioritizing what things might be useful later. Yep. But if you're forming memories all day, every day, for in Neil deGrasse Tyson's case, was he 50 something? Yep. For 50 years, uh, you're looking at what millions of memories? Right. There's no way that they don't get crossed, no. forgotten, combined misremembered i mean we've all done a version of this where we where we think um where we think about like we we have a story that happened with some friends and we think that two separate nights are one night right like you go like oh yeah and then we went to so and so after that and you're like no 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 that was a different night and you're like no mm -hmm. i'm pretty sure we and it's like it's not but the same group of people same tone or energy etc and your brain goes no that was the same night but well, it totally wasn't and that's without even getting into how like especially in group settings like that yeah everything that we remember is subjective because it's viewed through the way that we view things Exactly. Even, even just how I'm taking in information, my my sight, my hearing, all of that stuff is different from yours. Right. But then the way it's being processed, the way it's being stored, the way it's being maybe you thought about that night all the time after that, and, and I, I and I didn't, and then your memory is going to be very different for me. Or we were just looking at something from a different, literally looking at something from a different angle, and you saw something different than what I saw. Yes. Or you were closer to something that was being said, and you heard it differently than I did. Yep. Like there's, there is no objective, correct memory of a lot of things. One of the interesting things exactly related to what you're talking about right now that actually goes back to the Simons and Chabris studies that they've done is um, often people associate confidence with accuracy. Hmm. So I've learned to do the opposite most of the time. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, I feel you. I feel you. The more confident you are in something, the more skeptical I am of you usually. But often the biggest problem Shout out with to Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah, right. Yeah. Real talk. <laughs> Real talk. But most often the where this causes problems is in the court of law because often a witness, an eyewitness testimony with someone who believes themselves to be extremely confident about their correctness is more believed than someone who says, I'm pretty sure it was, but I don't, but, I, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't fucking, I wouldn't put my son's life up against it. But like, yeah, I don't know. I think so. And someone who goes, hell yeah, absolutely no question in my mind. What they find often in, whether it be court cases or general, um, like general. So it's like studies as it relates to um, the, like the videos we're talking about, like the, the simple sort of, you know, uh, backdrop videos, things changing. Do you notice things, whether or not your assuredness about those things are at a 10, I'm a hundred percent sure I saw what I saw, or I'm 1% sure what I saw. Uh, those are not connected to correctness ever. Right. Well, like there's no, a, there's no real connection there, which a, I think is important. That's such a, that's such a huge part of it. Right. That's a slightly different premise too, though, because you're not trying to find out what really happened necessarily. I mean, in, th in theory you are, but what you're actually doing is trying to convince 12 people of what happened. And sure. so all of the, all of those things, like how you present your information, how confident you appear, your general appearance, right. those all factor in. Sure. Just as much as the actual information does, yes. because you're not, you, your, your memory and your, recollection is subjective but the people making the ultimate decision are subjective too right as much as you're told to be objective and to factor in everything equally during the course of a case like it's impossible yeah of course those people are just as flawed as everyone else involved of course and i think and i think that uh that's so that's so key to so much of what they're talking about again like i know it's kind of beating this horse dead at this point but like Man, our like our memories are so faulty, man. Like we, yeah. we, we combine things, we we retell things, we make them more digestible in our brains. Sometimes we 
we forget important things. Sometimes we remember things that we think are 100% verbatim and then they're not like so much of our memory is so malleable in a way that our, our, our brains and our society, I think don't carve room for sometimes for good too, though. Can you like, can you imagine if you yeah. remembered vividly everything you'd ever fucked up? That's what we're talking about last week. Like right. the whole shit about like there, there, that whole, yeah. I mean, that would be and, awful. And, uh, that's for self-protection in some ways there. I, I didn't say it earlier, but Benjamin Kyle it, was quoted in one of the articles I read about him that uh, is saying like when he moved back to Indianapolis or to Lafayette, he before he left, he was saying he was kind of nervous about it because he thought that moving back there would bring some memories back, and they might not be good ones. And the the interviewer asked him like, "So like good and bad?" He's like, "Yeah, I'm sure some of them are bad, right? Because I'm mean, I mean, everyone has bad moments in life, but I, I'm sure for him, he was thinking too." I left this place for some reason and I lived off the grid for 20 years. And I don't really know why I did it that. It probably wasn't like a really great, memorable, monumental life event that yeah. spurred that. It was probably something pretty shitty. Right. And I'm not sure I want to relive that now right. that I have the option. To not indulge in that. Yeah. But I um, think it, some of that's got to be beneficial or ha has evolved to work exactly that way sure. right to allow for to retain the information that we really need yep and that's going to allow us to keep functioning rather than just all information equally all the time yes like we we train our brains all the time to be like oh he told me to focus on this aspect of this thing that i'm watching or listening to or doing cool i'm going to focus on that because 99 percent of the time that's what's going to be beneficial to me yeah, of course you can trick me once in a while because I, I've I've practiced doing this every day at school and at work and uh, sure. everywhere. I think though, I think though, where that falls apart often is in the face of traumatic experiences, things that are like really, really action and emotion packed, where our brains aren't necessarily saving like the right things; they're just saving something kind of. So mm. often they they find that in in traumatic events, people misremember or are capable of being like more influenced in their memory in other ways. How would you how would you test that though? So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of research around um, um, people who identify people out of lineups that are later discovered to be. Um, misidentified in lineups, people who are wrongfully convicted based on eyewitness testimony that that is the person that I saw in that moment. Um, idea being that um, you might not have the right person in a lineup, but if there's someone who shares a characteristic or or maybe doesn't share a characteristic but strikes in you a sense of fear or or something that you you ingest that person's uh, visual and you connect them to that moment and then you have a memory, quote unquote, that that is the person that did a thing to you. Like that's the guy that mugged me. Um, but people have been found to be very wrong by that. Again, people who are very convinced that they were right about that moment and that th that when they saw that sketch that they had the right person so so i, I completely think, agree with you that i think we save memory uh in ways that is trying to be beneficial to us but i also think that sometimes we save memory in ways that's like that's wrong you know we 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 save I, the wrong version of a word doc before it's fully finished or or however what, you want to metaphor i think it. what you're saying though could be attributed more to the brain trying to fill in information that it doesn't have. It's not like you remembered a different person mugging you. I would think it would more often be either you don't remember what the person looked like, you didn't see them clearly, or you were distracted by other things that were happening, like you were being mugged, that you looked at the knife instead of the person's face, or their face was obscured in some way. And then when you get in that lineup, you want to be able to tell the detective, yeah, it was him. You don't want to have to go in there and say, oh, I don't, 
I don't know. I don't remember what the guy looks like. Sure. I think the point and though, your brain, it may not even be conscious, but your brain is trying to fill in those gaps and say, yeah. well, it could be that, that person. Some of the characteristics fit. Yeah. It was probably that person. Cause yeah. then on a conscious and a subconscious level, you don't have to admit, I don't know. We didn't, we didn't take good notes that day. <laughs> right. Right. I, I think, I think to your point about, I think it obviously not obviously, but I think it definitely more often happens in an unconscious way. And I definitely think though that there, I mean, I don't think like I, like there are people who have been super convinced, like in that, in that exact situation you pointed out, not like I I don't want to tell the officer I'm wrong, but like, uh, oh, that's him. I know it's him. I, and then, and then it, again, it goes back to the ping pong thing. This is actually, there's a very specific, um, I don't even like saying this word on the podcast, but there's like a rape case with a woman who in a lineup got shown a bunch of police sketches and she pointed to a police sketch and then they brought in a lineup related to guys. And, um, once DNA came out 11 years later, she had pointed out a guy and had pointed him out in the courtroom and her testimony was like, that's him. He was in jail for 11 years and DNA cleared him of her assault 11 years later. And it, this actually became a really popular case. And I feel really bad because I pulled this up and didn't really intend to talk about it. And I don't have it right now. Um, but it became a popular case in the media as it related to her saying, I thought I did the right thing. I thought I knew what I was talking about, but I think there were so many elements that contributed to me so making this selection that I, I, I was, I was very sure in a situation that I didn't, I didn't know the, I didn't even know that I could have been unsure about it. Yeah, I guess that's what I'm saying. Just in a, the, and I think there are unconscious or subconscious and conscious versions of that. Yes, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, one thing I want to talk about before we go uh, that I think is oh, interesting shit. is uh, yeah we, we gotta we gotta close up about that t- about that time here uh, yeah is is a is a man uh, known as Kent Cochran um, known as or that is his name well um, that's his name <laughs> I. Uh, I, Are you sure about that? Yeah, yeah. I actually, I have to make sure um, Ooh, that we. I'll say, who <laughs> the fuck am I? It is Ken Cochran. That's right. I actually, for a second, related to the BK dude. I was like, wait, did he assume this name later, or is this his real name? <laughs> this is his real name. Whoa, um, baby boy. <laughs> so Ken was born in Toronto, Canada, in 1951, and. Um, Basically, uh, he was a memory disorder patient who spawned uh, 20 neuropsychology papers uh, over the over over a 25 year period. Um, in 1981, Cochrane was in a motorcycle accident that left him with severe. They call it anterograde amnesia, as well as temporally graded retrograde amnesia. Now, I'm not going to pretend to explain to you or know what those things Tem- exactly are. Temporal means time. Temporally graded retrograde amnesia. Retrograde means it happened before. Yeah. Or it's moving backwards or Mercury is moving backwards. Yeah. Because we don't understand science. Yes. Um, basically. What the- if astrology? <laughs> what if astrology? Um, basically the thing that made him a topic for a bunch of, uh, papers was he was one of the most perfect examples ever of a memory loss patient who had his semantic memory fully intact, but lacked any episodic memory with respect to his entire past. So your episodic memory, yeah. So your episodic memory is the memory of anything autobiographical, times, places, emotions, context, who, what, when, where, why. The memories that you have that are sort of the things that like ground you and who you are and where you are and why you are and what you are. That's your episodic memory. Your semantic memory are things that that refer to your general world knowledge that you accumulate throughout the course of your life. So things like facts or ideas, uh, concepts, um, generally things that you like you learn, but that are more so separate from yourself. So the the example that they give in terms of semantic memory that Kent had intact after his motorcycle accident was the difference between stalactites and stalagmites. Which I still don't remember the difference between. I was about to say, I have no idea. 
But that's... I mean, I, I have a 50% idea. <laughs> <laughs> Are they up there or down there? It's one of the two. Uh, I like that we're both in that same position and we're like... For some reason, that was really stressed in elementary school, though, as if I was ever going to need to know exactly. anything about a fucking cave. I, feel I know like, not to go in them. Yes. God. Dude, those dudes that dive in underwater caves, I'm like, you guys are psychopaths and I will never. This shit ain't regular, man. Not even a little bit. <laughs> um, so, so he was one of the most perfect examples of someone who post his motorcycle accident had his semantic memory fully intact but none of his episodic memory and the part of what makes this sort of fascinating was they, they did a bunch of papers about him on memory impairment neurological damage uh memory spelunking. storage and processing uh no spelunking <laughs> uh they did a bunch of studies about priming which actually this goes back to your your question about um senses and memory based on sentences uh or uh, excuse me not s senses not senses okay senses not sentences however the test that they gave cochran was based uh priming based on sentences where what they would do is they would give him um they would give him a series of sentences to read 60 like 64 i think it was and then it would come back to him a month later and ask him to fill in three missing words at the end of the sentences that they had given him a month before. So, okay, n obviously not an easy task. Uh, I was about to say there's zero percent chance I could do that right. unless it was like very obvious. Could be obviously determined by the context, right? Yes. Um, but the more that they found that they 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 call it priming, the more that they they primed him to remember things the better he got at remembering things in that way. So they Do you have any examples of these sentences? Um because like is one of them hello how are blank question no, mark. Um how are dog shit. Like okay so the way that they refer to it in in the article is uh researchers taught Cochrane 64 three word sentences over multiple testing trials and after 12 months presented the same sentences to him with the last of the three words missing. Okay. So. Seems like it'd be pretty easy to infer and or guess a lot of the time. But maybe, maybe not. But it, but it could be things like, you know, cars are, uh, you know, whatever. Or. Yeah. Lots of, lots of possibilities. Yeah. Like, there, you, you know, you probably feeling a lot are of adjectives. Cars. cars are fast. Cars <laughs> are cars. Cars are cars. <laughs> He just puts the first word in every time. Like, did nailed I get it, Chuck? It? Did I nail it? Wait, what was this guy's name? It wasn't Chuck. Uh, no, it's not. It was Kent. But <laughs> that's okay. It. Chuck Cochran. You said Todd Cochran a while ago, and I was like, "That's a Todd Cochran." Did I say that? Yeah. Oh man, I, I no. Goofed. You said like they taught Cochran oh, something. Oh, got it. I was like, I, was like, I goofed. That's that dude, not his that name. That dude's got all. a real Todd Cochran. I don't, I don't even. <laughs> that means I'm lost. Taught. It's an under taught underused word. T. Uh, so I guess the, the thing about Ken is he's not necessarily completely individual in his amnesia, but he was individual in the way that he so specifically remembered everything familially up to the point that he had his motorcycle accident. So he remembered his, he remembered his family. He remembered his mom. He remembered his aunt. He remembered, you know, going to going to the cabin with grandma and grandpa. He remembered like all of these things that were interpersonal and autobiographical up to the point that he had his motorcycle accident. And after that point, he was no longer able to make memories in that same area of the brain. So even though after his motorcycle accident, his brother died and his sister got married and a lot of things happened to him that were interpersonal and autobiographical in nature and in emotion, he wasn't actually capturing those memories anymore. However, the things that he that had happened to him previous to the accident, all the stalactite and stalagmite information, the equations, etc., he was able to learn more of those things after the accident and retain them in a way that he wasn't able to retain personal things about himself and his family. And that difference in amnesiacs is really important. And one of the biggest things about it that they 
decided, which they didn't come to a lot of conclusions around, but is super important, is the idea that memory is created in multiple different areas of the brain. For sure. And that getting struck or getting brain damage in a super specific area of the brain can affect one specific way and thing and type of memory that we remember and getting struck in another can detract that exact same thing in the inverse of what Kent experienced. So and getting he, struck in a third can make you a brilliant pianist. Yeah, exactly. Like we talked about last week. I don't know if we actually did, but I did, was going to, I did you know. chop it? You talked about, we talked about okay. it. I don't know. Yeah. I, I experienced, or not personally experienced, but witnessed something similar to that when uh, a few years ago, my my grandma had dementia or developed dementia. And from the point that she developed dementia on, couldn't really create new memories. Sure. And stuff in the past was fine. Yep. And her recall of it was pretty solid. Yeah. But there was like a... A, a year or so kind of gray area and then right. like nothing new after that word and it seemed to be more related to um like personal autobiographical stuff not sure. the factual information right so like around the time that she developed dementia my mom her daughter died and she did like it wasn't like it was fuzzy she had no recollection of it happening mm. and <clears throat> but she remembered everything else about her up until that point. Sure. And so there were these, like, there was just this almost like a hard cutoff of just the day that whatever part of her brain was where that stuff happened just stopped. Man. But everything else was more or less fine. Or, at le- you know, at least that of, like, a 85-year-old. Yeah, yeah. More, I'm, And I think, like, more so than anything, just, like the thing that's so so wild about that to me is just the idea that at a at a time based on generally speaking an incident of some sort our brains can just stop functioning in that way yeah and it can preserve what it has functioned to create up to that point but it can no longer make more of that thing it's like it's almost like there's like a there's a finite ability to build or it's like your your memories or something rerouting resources you know like yeah. this stuff is not vital but that would you would almost think it would be the opposite in the case of dementia you would think you'd start getting rid of old shit and your working memory would be more important right but that was weird too because like in the in a moment for an hour or however long she was engaged in something yep. it was fine and sure. but then as soon as you step away and try and come back to it, it was totally gone. Man, so there that's was so some tough. some transfer that wasn't happening. Like you could have a conversation with her, and even just like stop and watch TV for a few minutes, and then go back, and she would you're just starting over. Right. Man, it's weird stuff, dude. It's really weird stuff, and and I know like we make jokes a lot about how I have like existential crises about about stuff, but I. I I do, for me, the memory one is big because I I feel like, who are we without the things that we remember? Like the, the every Dude, experience that we've had as people are the things that, is that you at build that point. and build and build and build to become who we are. The way that we talk to people, the way that we interact, the things that we enjoy, all of those things are building blocks that get added onto over the course of our entire lives to have chunks or vast chunks or the entirety of those things extracted from our ability to like remember and be is like really fucking dude. Dementia and Alzheimer's are brutal and terrifying. The worst. It's the worst. But that was, and I didn't say this early, but that was the fascinating part about is like personality wise, she was exactly the same. Sure. And so, so those building blocks somehow duck in some way yeah, there, yeah there's like a deeper and the, like the same stuff we were talking about with with uh benjamin kyle he was saying like i know who i am right my personality is what it's always been I, right he doesn't know that but he knows that right it seems and strong yet, to him yeah i can't tell you what i've done for 30 years right 
but I know exactly who I am and what I like and what right. I don't like and what books I've read and right. all this stuff. So there's there's like a it's almost like there's a deeper level, an intuitive level that is operating separate from the the long term or short term or right. any other forms of memory. Right. That is just kind of in, inherently who you are. Yeah. But yeah, that that shit is terrifying, dude. I. Yeah. Freaks me right the fuck out. Yeah, I think man. the um, having watched somebody go through that firsthand is yeah. brutal, dude. Yeah, man, that's that's awful. I, I I know we talked about this last week too, but I feel like you know with the show, the more that we, I said this maybe this exact sentence, but I'm really legitimately thinking it right now. It's like the more that we dive into the brain, it's so obvious how little we fully understand it and how it works and what it does and when it stops doing something, why does it stop doing it? Like, there's so many procedures and processes and and things that we just don't fucking get. We don't. We don't have it. And we, probably can't. And probably can't. Like I, Until I, we build artificial intelligence <laughs> smarter than our own brains to tell us how our own brains work. Balls, 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 I am. <laughs> balls to you. Balls, 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 balls. Did you see they shut that down? Yeah. They yeah, somebody, announced they shut it down because they were scared. <laughs> they got scared, bro. As they fucking should be, man. It said balls one too many times so they got fucking freaked out, man. Like, Get in my ass and think about what you've done. <laughs> we got to shut these robots down. <laughs> these robots like balls way too much and I'm no longer interested. Yeah, one of, uh, shout out to one of our listeners for putting me on to that yesterday. It's phenomenal. Yeah, dude. Uh, All right, man. Fuck. That's, that's our time. I guess that's it, huh? Uh, we love you guys. Go uh, go to whatifpodcast.com. Uh, check us out. Hit us up if you want to suggest a show. Uh, yell at us. Tell us we're dumb. Tell us that a lie may or may not have been born. A lie was born. <laughs> and, um, and, it gets uh, better every time. It so does. And uh, go to go to whatifpodcast.com slash survey if you want to help us out. Uh, just fill out a survey. I legitimately, it'll take you less than 30 seconds. It's like five questions. And um, we promise we'll never use it to hit you up. It's literally just for us to be able to tell people who our listeners are generally speaking. I have so many dope Simpsons gifts on deck that I would like to use. Yes. Please. Holler at us. Tweet us at what if pod uh, and uh, let us know and we'll tweet you back a a Simpsons uh, gif once you have filled out that survey. True. And uh, otherwise, leave us a rating review on iTunes and see you all next week. Otherwise, we'll see you. Next week. We'll be back with Merrick Mason. We're gonna talk about Oh yeah, right. We get we can't tease that for an hour and a half and then not deliver. What are we talking about next week? Uh I think the question is what if you were in two places at once? Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about Doppelgangers. Doppelgangers. Doppelgangas. We're gonna talk about uh maybe a little bit of quantum mechanics slash physics. See and if we can get that like a good smart. a good three hours of astral projection. So Yeah. Uh, so Coming at you. We'll see you with all of that next week on the What It Podcast. We love you guys very much. Bye. Bye. Everyone was pretty ugly, but it was still a pretty good time. <laughs> we'll be back next week with another episode of the What If Podcast. Learn more at www.whatifpodcast.com. 